Good morning. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through 28. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me, the word of the Lord. Thanks, Joelle. And thanks for being seated. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to bring uh, our sermon this morning from Philippians 2. So in our culture, we love this idea of freedom. Right? We just celebrated our, a national holiday all about freedom. And our culture is primarily characterized by a freedom from kind of mentality. It's freedom from oppression, freedom from tyranny, freedom from authoritarianism. But in the Bible, we, we not only get a freedom from sin and death, but also a freedom towards something, a freedom towards God, freedom towards obedience, and not just any obedience, but a, a joyful obedience. In our culture, we don't really like this word, obedience. We also associate it with these ideas of uh, tyranny and with authoritarianism. Maybe it was uh, an authoritarian parent who was um, really, really harsh, or, uh, and it was disobedience actually allowed you to get away and to get to safety. That's a good thing, uh, but sometimes we associate obedience or disobedience in that way. Or it, obedience maybe was a way that you earned your way into the family, and it was a form of self-righteousness. Um, in both ways, obedience is kind of being used in a, either a self-serving way or um, in a way that's not joyful. It's, it's not something that brings, us, brings out our true desires. And so in our passage today, we not only see uh, a freedom that is not only desirable, um, it's not only a, an obedience that's undesirable, but rather it's very desirable and it's full of joy. And so what we have to see today is, uh, we're going to call it a joyful obedience. And so in order to uh, get to this idea of joyful obedience, we have to see three things. So we have to see the need for obedience, the power for obedience, and the cost for obedience. So the need, the power, and the cost. So first we have the need for obedience. So in verse 15 of our passage, uh, Paul says this, that he says that we need to be blameless or that we should, we will be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish. And so this is kind of getting at this Old Testament idea of purity and, and impurity, that the way we can dwell with God is if we are blameless and innocent without blemish, uh, that God's will for our lives is that we would be blameless and innocent so that we might dwell with him. And that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, and we read that, uh, that human beings dwelled with God, that uh, God walked with them in the garden, that they had this perfect union, that their desires, Adam and Eve's desires, and God's desires, their wills aligned perfectly, so that from the beginning, from our creation, we were made good. God calls us very good from our beginning. But it wasn't until that Adam and Eve believed the lie of the serpent that, that they would be able to take 
uh, for themselves, their own obedience, that they would be able to bend their wills from obeying God in a joyful obedience to, I'm going to obey myself. We're going to bend, they bent their obedience towards the self and made it crooked. So the reason we need obedience uh, is not because it's just good for us or that it's our way, our ticket into heaven. But it, it was our created order. It was our original design was to find um, joy in obeying God. So our cultural narrative today uh, likes to tell this story about how we need to find uh, true freedom in ourselves, right? We have to discover our authentic self and to express that out into the world. And this author that uh, I came across, Eckhart Tolle, he is the author of The Power of Now, which you may have heard of. It's pretty popular. He's uh, on Oprah Winfrey's uh, book club list. And he's also this author of um, this book called A New Earth. And he has this pretty famous quote from it. And he says, uh, only the truth of who you are, if realized, will set you free. Only the truth of who you are, if realized, will set you free. Uh, And so this is kind of what I'm talking about when I think about, like, okay, what's the story that our culture is kind of telling us? What are the things that we're hearing about who we are and how we find true happiness, how we find freedom um, in we, we find authors like Eckhart Tolle who find their way um, having very successful careers in thinking this way. And so uh, what I want to do is kind of talk about this in relation to also what the Bible says. We're going to have a little conversation. Uh, so if I were to sit down with, uh, with Eckhart Tolle, uh, I might ask him a question. I might ask him, so if this is uh, what you believe, then like what, what are you free from? Like what, what is it that you're being free from? And more importantly, what are you being free to do? And if that freedom to do is more just freedom for yourself and freedom to do whatever you want, then I think the Bible, and I might argue that you're not actually free, you're just free to do whatever your desires are asking you to do. And so as the Bible might say, you're actually still a slave to your own sin. You're, you're still controlled by your own desires. And so when we follow the cultural pattern of you do you, it inevitably still leads us down a path of of chaos into sin. Uh, And I don't know about you, but when I start to do me, like when I just do the things that I want to do, things don't go better. They they don't get better. My my house becomes a mess. Um, I I start just sitting on my phone for hours, and uh, my anxiety increases like, I need that structure in order. I need, I need something to, to follow in order for me to find uh, a, a good freedom, a good way forward in life. And so, uh, and so a natural question then might be, um, how then is there any hope for us, right? If we are to be blameless and perfect, and that's God's requirement of us, but we, we've seen that the world is broken, and ever since the fall, we've not been able to get back on our own, then... How are we to become blameless and perfect? And so then that leads to our next point. So we've seen the need for obedience. We have to be restored to our original uh, design, but also we have the power for obedience. Uh, So in the power for obedience, we come across this part of our text. So we're going to reread this part. So if you have a Bible uh, with you or on your phone, you can read with me or on the screen. Uh, So therefore, my beloved, Paul says, as you have always obeyed, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So we're going to kind of focus in on this phrase here, right? That's the one that gets a lot of attention. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, So two theological concepts come up in uh, in this verse, and there's these two, justification and sanctification. So you can say these with me because they're really important, right? So we say justification and sanctification. These are really good words to have in the back of your head. We're going to have really easy definitions for us today. So for justification, we're going to call that, it's a declaration, right? Justification is God's declaration of your standing before him, right? This is like when, uh, when the judge comes into the courtroom, the jury reads the verdict, and he gives the declaration guilty or innocent, right? Your justification is your declaration of your status before God. And whenever uh, we come to faith in him, whenever we come to faith in Christ, 
our declaration is that we're found righteous, right? But not because of what we have done, but because of the work of Christ. So we have justification. And just to root this in the text, uh, we find this word, we find this idea of justification as word salvation, right? So work out your own salvation. This is something that has already happened to the Philippians, right? They're the believing church in Philippi. And it's something, their justification, their declaration of their righteousness is something that happened in the past in Paul's time. So work out your own salvation saying, now that you've been saved, do the work of being saved. Do the things that saved people do. Work, work it out your own salvation. So that's justification. But then we also have this idea of sanctification, which is, we're going to call it the ongoing work, or maybe the, you could say the more and more of the Christian life, becoming more and more like Christ. And so think back to when we studied Invitation to a Journey, Robert Mulholland, right? We had this uh, definition of becoming, uh, the Christian life being characterized by becoming more and more conformed to the image of Christ. Uh, That idea is the same idea of sanctification. So this is what happens after justification. And I'm going to move on quickly here. But justification is the declaration. Sanctification is what what happens after your salvation. Because I think we all realize that we, we are not yet made perfect, right? We're not yet there. We're not glorified. And so, though we can take on the righteousness of Christ in our declaration, but we still have, the Holy Spirit still has some work to do in our lives, right? So that's the need for sanctification. And so now that we've kind of heard what these two words are like, um, we can now, let's read this passage. Actually, I'm going to go back a little bit because sanctification is rooted here in this word, right? Work out. So the work out, this is the word, um, literally means to like cause or to make, uh, to make happen. Um, it's a very practical word. You really can't get away from the idea that, um, that you have to do something here, right? Paul is not saying like, okay, now that you're saved, don't do anything. He's saying, work it out. Do the thing that saved people do. It's saying, work out the effects of your salvation in the world around you. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So now that um, we've seen these two words, we can see uh, what's happening in this passage. So he's saying, work out your own salvation. For, and this is the power. For it is God who works in you. Right? It is God who works in you. And that doesn't give you an excuse not to do the working out, right? It's just saying that God is the one who's actually empowering you, realigning your desires to obey him, and realigning uh, your will with his will. It's restoring that creational design in order that we can then do the act of joyful obedience. So now that we've seen uh, the need for obedience and the power for obedience, now we have to understand the cost of the obedience. Uh, So I kind of break this down in a few ways. So we have a personal cost and then there's an ultimate cost. But the personal cost, um, we have we have a nice little drawing that um, some great artists made at some point, but um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave it out in the in the real world there. But um, this is just a graph, okay? And we're, we're, I'm gonna break it down for you. So we have we have a y-axis here that's vertical. We got a horizontal on the bottom, and then this one here is over time, okay? And we're gonna break each of these down. So the first one we have, or we're gonna call this the three dimensions of uh, personal obedience. And so, firstly, we have our, our vertical graph. And we, this is where we can really start breaking down our text. So he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So this, this part here, with fear and trembling, is talking about the vertical dimension. He's talking about your relationship to God. And he mentions this first because that's, that's one of the most important things, right? Is that your relationship with God would be set right. Because without that, your, your relationship with other people are not going to be it's not going to be aligned in, the, in, in a good way. Um, when we have the right orientation to God, when we, when we are justified in him, then our, our relationships to other people can start to have effect. And so we have this vertical humility, which is basically me summarizing fear and trembling. I'm saying that that's kind of like a, a humility to God, right? Seeing him for who he is. So when we gaze upon the beauty of Christ in our own lives, uh, we we can have a more right relationship with one another. Uh, and 
it's, for instance, gazing upon God, it's, it's kind of like seeing a beautiful sunset, right? We just had one uh, a couple nights ago, I think. Um, and I think I was going on a walk with my wife, Hillary, and it was just, it was amazing. It was just this burning orange uh, glow in the sky. And it just made me think like, wow, like, God, you're so amazing that you can like make all this. And yet you're even greater than that. That's, this is the idea of, of, ver- of vertical humility and this, this ought to um, condone an awe or a fear and trembling in us. And so secondly, so that's vertical humility. Secondly, we've got to have our horizontal humility. And we see this in verse 14. He says, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent. And so we already talked about that a little bit. So we're going to talk about this. Do all things without grumbling and disputing. So now he's talking about your relationships with the people around you. He's talking about what's going on in church. He's talking about what's going on at work. We're, he's, he's not even just talking about only the church, which, by the way, this is you. It should say y'all. Because this, this is, he's talking to the church, right? He's talking to everybody there. Um, and so do all things without grumbling or disputing. He's saying in all things, in, in your church life, in, in your work life, uh, in every area of your life, um, we ought to have this humility, which is another way of me summarizing what this is, grumbling or disputing. Um, we're supposed to have this humility with one another. And the Philippians had an excellent example of this. So this word um, grumbling is referring back to uh, the book of Numbers. And if you think back, you know, way back when we talked about the book of Numbers last year, then um, you'll remember that the Israelites had a lot of grumbling. They had a They had a lot of distrust of God. They had a lot of distrust for one another. And so what he's basically saying, don't be like them. Learn from them. You are the new covenant family, the new covenant community. Uh, Do not do the same mistake that they did. And so when when we put others before ourselves, when we choose to be curious about others' lives, when we listen before we speak, when we have the patience to get to know someone over a long time and spend time with one another, that is, those are examples of horizontal humility. And so uh, there are many ways for your salvation to be worked out in the world, right? Working out our own salvation. This is one of them, is to have this humility with each other, to have the intentionality of getting to know one another. And so don't hear me saying either that uh, we ought to let people walk all, all over us. Like, we don't want to be doormats uh, for, for other people. Um, but what it is saying, what Paul is saying, is that when we have this kind of humility towards one another, our, our lives begin to find more of an order. We, we begin to have that original creational uh, design uh, expressed out into our lives. And so thirdly, we're going to talk about um, the... This little, oh wait, yeah, there's a, there's a second part here. I, I'm getting to it now. Okay, so the second part is that the result, okay, so whenever you practice this horizontal humility, you, there's an effect, and he talks about, so we'll be children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked generation, among whom y'all shine as lights in the world, and we have a nice shining church here. And so whenever we shine, we're not, we're not shining because, oh, yeah, now we're working out our own salvation. We're being righteous. We're, we're like, look how good we are. Like, we can already look in our church. Like, we, we can look in our own lives and say, wow, like, we're not doing this perfectly. And that's okay. And that's okay because we don't reflect our own glory. We reflect God's glory, right? God is shining down on top into our lives. He's the energizing power in us. And so then we can look at God and say, wow, God, look how great you are. And now I'm going to shine that glory out to those around us. And so, uh, so that's our, that's the result is that we, uh, we shine out into others around us. And not only that, but then they become interested. They, they might say, wow, like, what is this good, joyful obedience that you have? Uh, okay. And so now we get to look at this diagonal line called the z-axis. This is over time, and here we have what we call, what Paul calls the day of Christ, right? So this is the hope, and here's my old Jesus here, and so he's got a crown. I don't know if you can see that, but
But so holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run or labor in vain. So <clears throat> Paul is showing us an example here. He's, he's modeling that his hope is not right now. His hope is not in his circumstances, in his imprisonment, in his imminent death, when he talks about uh, being poured out as a drink offering. What he's talking about is modeling a hope. He's modeling the hope that in the day of Christ, that we'd be found, uh, we'd be found righteous in Christ. His hope is set into the future. So when we have this, we have this vertical humility, we have a horizontal humility to one another, but we also have a hope that's anchored in the day of Christ, in a future moment. And so, whatever it is in your life that's afflicting you right now, this is where we get real personal, these things can be endured. And it doesn't mean that they're not hard. We, we should recognize that, yeah, these things are really hard, whether, whether you're, you're dealing with a sickness, whether you're dealing with, uh, with marital issues, whether you're dealing with struggling with singleness or with work and school, whether you're de- whatever it is you're dealing with, I want to take a moment to recognize those things are really hard, right? They're really hard. But they don't get the last word, right? They don't get the last word because in the end, it's Christ. In the end, it's the day of Christ. It's, it's the day that we, can, we will come to him and he will look at us. And when we have faith in him, he'll look at us and say, you're mine, you're righteous. Not because of what you've done or the goodness that you have, but because I died for you. You are my joy. And here it is for you. And so we can celebrate and hope and endure because of this day of Christ. And so we can't just live life with only God. We can't just live life with only one another. But we also need we, the one way we endure life with one another and with God is with a hope that in a future day that we will be found righteous in him. And so this is our personal cost, right? Our personal cost is, is our humility, right? But there's also an ultimate cost. And that ultimate cost was ultimately paid by Christ, right? So Christ, I'm going to do some uh, verse dumping here. So in verse 8, back when uh, a couple weeks ago we talked about how Christ uh, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Christ humbled himself. He's the ultimate, he has the ultimate uh, hum- vertical humility. But also in verse 7, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. He also has the ultimate horizontal humility, right? He's, he's got that horizontal humility. And also in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, we read that uh, in we read that it was because of the joy that was set before him. Jesus has the ultimate joy, uh, and that joy wasn't just uh, his glorification into heaven. He was looking at the cross and seeing what was the effect of the cross. What was going to be the effect? And the effect was that you would be able, through faith in him, to have life with him in the day of Christ. He had the ultimate joy. So because Christ is the ultimate model of these things, he's done it first. He, you can also follow his example. And not only that, but he did it all for you so that you're, you don't have to earn your way into that. <clears throat> so Christ's ultimate joy was that by the end of the race, his reward was uh, the task of, his reward was the accomplishing of the task for paying the price for eternal life with you. The ultimate cost is paid by Christ. And with his energy, energizing help, right, God's power working through you, we too can live a life of joyful obedience. So this is the hope of the gospel, right? This is the hope that we can live with today. This is how we can have a free and willing and loving obedience to God that brings us true freedom, not because it's something we discover within ourselves, but because it's the energizing presence of God through us. So do you want this kind of freedom? It's being offered to you this day. And so if you're willing, will you please pray with me? 
Father God, we recognize that we cannot do uh, this life on our own. We recognize that um, as best our efforts are um, to require perfect obedience from us. Lord, help us to see the need um, to be restored into our original design. And help us to look to you for the energizing power of obedience. Lord, we see how Christ is the perfect obedient uh, servant. Help us to follow his, his model, but even more so to look to him uh, in, in our deepest and uh, in our darkest times when we need him most. Lord, give us the, the, your energizing presence to, to follow you, to live humbly with one another, and to live as shining lights for the rest of the world, Lord, to not just show off our, anything good within us, but to show you off, to show off your glory, to be reflections of you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.